Welcome everyone to CSI, CSI Skill Tree. Uh, in this series, we take a close look at video games to examine and celebrate the work they do in envisioning the future and building rich, thought-provoking worlds. Uh, my name is Joey Eshrick. Uh, I work at the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University, and I'll be your host. Um, today, we're going to talk about Mutazione, a 2019 game developed by the Copenhagen-based studio Daigut Fabrik and published by Akipara Games. And part of why we picked this game, amongst the many reasons that you'll learn, is, is that you can play it on nearly any platform. So no matter what kind of hardware you've got, it's um, available for PC and Mac computers, iPhones and iPads. Uh, you can play it on Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo Switch consoles. So if you have anything that can play games, it can probably play this game uh, and do it pretty well. Um, Mutazione starts with the player character, whose uh, name is Kai, taking a boat to a remote, mostly isolated island where her mother was raised to visit her dying grandfather. The island has experienced a mysterious catastrophe sometime in the past, causing its surviving inhabitants to transform physically and uh, catalyzing strange environmental changes. Over the course of the game, uh, Kai learns more about the island's history, its flora and fauna, and its rather delightful group of inhabitants who make up a supportive, close-knit, but sometimes quarrelsome community. Uh, its developers describe Mutazione as a mutant soap opera, as well as a magical gardening game, and we'll get into all of that. It features a gentle, emotionally complex approach to world building in the wake of catastrophe, and uh, other things we'll discuss today are the game's musical elements, the connections it makes between social relations and gardens, its exploration of the politics of knowledge production, and its metaphors for climate trauma uh, and the fragility of ecosystems. Okay, so that's like a lot for us to do. But to do all that, I'm fortunate to have two uh, amazing guests with me today. The first is uh, Pamela Carlero, who is an assistant professor of environmental humanities at Kettering University in Flint, Michigan. Pamela, hi. Uh, her research focuses on building climate resilience at the community level, and her scholarship investigates how eco-criticism informs the communication and experience of climate risk. Uh, she's currently leading a project funded by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is titled Climate Resilient Flint, Building Community-Driven Climate Resilience Through Hyperlocal Science to Civics Learning, a characteristically long name for a <laughs> federally funded right. project, but you did a great job, Joey. <laughs> I practiced all of that so I could make sure to hit it. Um, I'm also honored to be joined by uh, Matthew Derby, who's a, a writer and designer whose credits include the scripted podcast, Harley Quinn and the Joker, Sound Mind, the feature film Gone in the Night, and The Silent History, which is an interactive novel designed and written for iOS devices. He served as an editor at the magazine, The Believer, and as a game designer at Harmonix, Epic Games. I always add um, the first thing I ever read by Matthew is Super Flat Times, which is a collection of linked short stories. And it's like one of the few pieces of speculative fiction that I always recommend to whomever is asking. It's on like the core list to which I add things, but there's only like three or four books that I'm just like, everyone should read these. Um, so Super Flat Times. Uh, okay, so we're going to start off today by watching a, a few minutes of edited gameplay from the early stages of Mutazione to give you a sense of the game's look, sounds, and feel, and to provide a peek at various mechanics, including uh, navigating conversations, exploring the town, gardening, and consulting, uh, you'll see very briefly, a, a reference book that you get in game about the island's plant life. Um, then the three of us will introduce the game in a bit more detail and then delve into some of the bigger themes and narrative movements. Um, Throughout the conversation, anytime, just please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window if you want to submit a question or comment. We always reserve some time at the end to respond, um, but you don't have to wait until the end to, to, to write something and, and put it in front of us. So as soon as something occurs to you, please uh, drop it in there using Q&A, uh, and we would love to hear from you. Uh, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And Pamela and, and Matthew, thank you for making the time today. Um, yeah, thanks for having us. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and without uh, further ado, uh, let's get underway. I'm just going to switch over to this video.
So, Pamela, I want to start by, if I may, directing kind of a question to you to help us get going. Um, so, uh, Mutazione, as I understand, is the first video game you'd played in, in many years. So, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your experience with it, like re-encountering games through the lens of this one, and to maybe help introduce us to the world of this game and, and, and what you actually get up to as you're playing it. Yeah, well, let me maybe start with the world of the game and then go to my experience because maybe Absolutely. that will make more sense um, that way. So you you kind of you summarized it really beautifully. Um, the only things that I would add uh, for for our viewers is that um, the protagonist Kai is going to visit their grandfather Nono who is ailing and Kai and Nono don't previously, they don't have um, any kind of previous relationship and actually family um, relations are tense between Nono and the rest of the family. Um, so it's really kind of a, as, as Kai reaches the island and begins to explore and encounter the community's inhabitants, which are all mutants um, from this meteor strike that happened like, uh, I don't know, a generation and a half ago. What um, you're doing as you maneuver with Kai through these various experiences is um, it's kind of like a detective uh, uh, story where you're uncovering the history of, um, of the island. Um, you're uncovering the experiences of the different characters um, and no, no, and through this new knowledge, these nodules of knowledge that you pick up along the way um, by interacting with, with fauna and with flora and with um, uh, the inhabitants themselves, um, you kind of begin to bring Nono back to health and you figure out what happened after the meteor strike strike. So I'll leave it there because I don't want to, I don't want to give any spoilers, but um, the, the thing that I really loved is that the island is really lush and dense with new ecological life, which Kai, Kai explores um, throughout the, throughout the game. So maybe that leads me into a segue or so, yeah, leads me into segueing um, into my, my own experiences. Uh, this was the first time that I've played a game since um, middle school with my siblings on GameCube. <laughs> and it was probably like, we were probably playing one of the Legends of Zelda. So it's been a very long time um, and I'm not, I'm not a gamer um, as a, um, but as a uh, kind of a scholar of eco-criticism, I am really interested in narrative. And that's what hooked me um, in this, uh, uh, with this specific game. So for anybody who is, uh, you know, out there and thinking of maybe using you, me, uh, Mutazione as your foray into the gaming world or your bridge into the gaming world, um, it was a really interesting experience coming from kind of no, no previous contemporary experience and kind of a lot of built up stereotypes that I had of, of the gaming world. So sorry, everybody, I'm incredibly green and these stereotypes, um, as I've, I've learned, are um, incredibly incorrect. But I always envisioned games as something that was really vertical in nature. Um, you had a series of levels. Um, at the end of each level, you had some sort of figure who you had to battle or overcome using your, um, I don't know, um, uh, you know, prowess uh, and any kind of objects and, and artifacts that you would find along the way. And so you move through kind of this really, this hierarchy of, of levels through kind of a really combative experience and you win through, through kind of, um, um, I don't know, yeah, uh, more of an aggressive, through more of an aggressive stance. So I was kind of hesitant <laughs> to get into gaming because of this, this stereotype that I had. Mutasian completely turns that around. And I know that many games are, are, um, are like Mutasian. So, so sorry, I absolutely don't mean to, <laughs> to offend anyone, but since coming to the game with that specific stere stereotype, um, I loved uh, the horizontal structure of the game. And when I mean horizontal structure, I mean that you are um, uh, navigating with Kai through a series of, you know, pathways and structures within the community itself, within the environment around, around the community. Um, and what you're doing throughout is you're building relations. Um, so you're not necessarily progressing through levels, you're progressing through chapters and the progression through chapters happens when Kai encounters someone or uh, learns something new and kind of internalizes that. And um, in my, um, my own analysis <laughs> of Kai's character, uh, they, they begin to develop as, as a result. So um, 
uh, I love that kind of very rhizomatic plant world like structure that that for me is something that's uh, uh, that really stood out to me and, and, and grabbed me with this with this game. <laughs> And is there anything you you want to add about kind of the grammar of the game and and uh, or, or or even just what it was like for you to experience it uh, uh, as you first encountered it? I have a sort of a follow up question for you that gets a bit more mechanical, but I wanted to give you a chance to uh, add to or respond to what uh, Pamela uh, said first. Yeah, sure. Well, I love Pamela. I love that description of it as rhizomatic, like that the narrative form and how it how um, how that echoes the you know, the, the world of the game, this lush overgrown landscape. Um, and yeah, and that, so that made me think of, uh, you know, as um, I watched a, a GDC talk by uh, Hannah Nicklin, the, the writer of the game who, who, who um, talked about that, that exact structure. And, um, you know, she referred to it as, uh, multiple middles, which is this story that begins that. in one place. Yeah. And then branches out and then concludes that, you know, it, it, it all comes back to a single ending. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, you know, that both allows the story to sprawl, but in mm -hmm. a way that, um, you know, that you can see progression and, um, you can watch the story unfold at your own pace and follow the the characters and storylines that most appeal to you. Um, you know, and so that it, it, you know that that is sort of you're you're sort of free to explore. And then there's this uh, Kai's journal, which is a sort of like mm -hmm. diegetic element that tells you like, oh, you should really, you know, Kai wonders like what, one of the characters is thinking on a particular day. And so that's a sort of nudge for you to go mm -hmm. and uh, talk to that other character. So it's this really um, beautiful way that the story like nudges you along um, without sort of forcing you and allowing you to like soak in the world at your own pace, which I think is, is super unusual. And, and th this game does just does it so well. Yeah, it struck me like kind of playing a bit more of it again uh, for a second time that it it has this element of being a bit of a mystery. There's a, some mm -hmm. kind of like um, you're not detecting, but you're you're gathering information and trying to unravel this mystery. And not everybody is so forthcoming because people have various like, I don't know, personal and ideological and emotional reasons that they don't want to tell you everything. Um, so you are progressing in that way. And then there's some self-knowledge, I think, as you said, Pamela, for the protagonist, but um, it is also not a game about accumulating power. And often it feels like you're taking a step backward or characters you're rooting for um, encounter a bit of a setback or they make a mistake. Um, you come to think that's maybe some of the things that you've been doing later in the game, like you think some of the stuff you did early on, like might have takes on a different valence or meaning for you now that you know the larger context. And so it doesn't feel um, to get a sense of horizontality. It's not like you're ascending mm -hmm. a staircase necessarily. It's like you're exploring this terrain and really getting more about the history and the past um, more so than like using power to shape the future in this game. Like it's more just like you to understand this community, you have to understand this web of relationships, but also the past. And then as it turns out, you have to understand what's happening underground the island. And it's mm -hmm. like, there's all this sort of like, um, uh, yeah, information gathering that you're, that you're doing throughout. But, but as, as Matthew said, you can kind of like do that in so many different ways and you can and you can sort of really invest in certain characters or kind of like let them take a back seat and only talk to them when you need to and lets you kind of wend your own way through it. Um, Matthew, I wanna follow up on that and just say, you know, just ask you, you know, as someone who has not only told stories and built worlds in a bunch of formats, but also in, in actually, actually created music games for, for harmonics, like, we haven't talked so much about that. How does Mutazioni work as a as a music game, and how does making and listening to music work as as part of the the story, as part of this universe, mm -hmm. as part of the experience of play? Yeah, well, yeah, uh, as you said, Joyce, I I work at Harmonics, where and you know we we make music games. So we created the the rock band franchise and Dance Central, and um, so we uh, you know and as a sort of mid size game studio like 
we're always trying to make games that, you know, they have to appeal to 68 million people, you know, so they have to, so that, they, they, you know, we're sort of constrained in the, the kinds of games that we can make. So, um, but meanwhile, you know, as developers, we are always hungry to find like, you know, new, new uh, music game experiences. And so when I heard that, uh, you know, I think it was Douglas Wilson, who was the uh, uh, audio engineer on this game, uh, you know, describe it as music for airports, the game, you know, I was completely sold, you know, so it's, for those of you who don't know, music for airports is this uh, is a very famous uh, Brian Eno uh, ambient composition that really kind of defined the, the ambient music genre. And, uh, you know, I've been a huge fan of that game for a long time and so you know the the idea that you could sort of create your own ambient soundscape um through this uh musical magical gardening uh mechanic was just incredibly appealing um and you know and i think it it it's the way that it is so deeply bound into the story that makes it so successful like we've We've done, you know, we, we've prototyped and and done dabbled in this sort of like procedural music uh, generation uh, mechanic before, but the the thing that the um, that this studio did so well was to um, was to to pair this act of gardening, this um, you know that you're taking care of this plot of land and you're gathering seeds and planting them. Uh, and you watch them grow and, um, the, um, the thing that you do to, to grow the plants isn't to, it's not like a, a, a farming sim where you're mm -hmm. constantly like, uh, you know, like, uh, raking the soil and pretending to it. The central mechanic of this game is to listen and you know you saw for a second in that uh clip that Joey showed at the beginning you know one of the key player actions in tending the garden is to just listen and you you uh, are uh you know which is it, it's interesting uh, from a game design perspective because to listen is a very passive activity right in mm -hmm. in game design we we're always talking about you know for these sort of active player verbs like run crouch strafe jump you know and in this game, you know, both in the uh, the tending of this garden and really in all of your conversations that that Pamela was talking about earlier, your primary uh, mode as Kai is to listen and to pay attention. And the the fact that those are those those verbs are are, you know, they're they're very passive verbs, but the game feels incredibly active and alive and changes before you. Um, and your interactions with the characters change uh, the the course of the story. So it just felt like such an elegant way to pair this this gardening, which is its own kind of reward of, you know, you're you're not like planting these seeds to go sell them to the shopkeeper mm -hmm. for a tractor, you know, like you are, um, you're creating, you're generating this um, magical place. Um, and that, so that's what you're doing on a micro scale and your interactions with this community change the community on this larger scale. I just think that that pairing is so, is done so elegantly. It's completely spellbinding. Yeah, I should, I should add just to, to provide some background on top of the video uh which was quick on purpose i didn't want us watching like 15 minutes of gameplay right out at the front but um that each plant that you select for a, gar a particular garden uh it basically they're they're classified as like making different sounds right matt like they generate you know a, a fern yeah. will generate a different sound than a type of mushroom than a type of water lily and um you're kind of guided towards plants that are classified a certain way. You play music to help the plants grow. Different plants react to different songs. You learn them at different times in the game. So there's some, there's there's a fair amount of guidance if you don't really know what you're doing. You, it's like it's, mm -hmm. there's color coding. And but on the other hand, you can actually 
replant the same gardens or play more than once and experiment with different soundscapes by putting uh, different collections of plants together. Um, and it's when you listen and then you can go back and the game doesn't penalize you really in any way for like taking plants out. It's called salvaging them. And then you mm -hmm. can replant in those same areas to create these different soundscapes that, um, and then each garden in the game is kind of meant to sort of intended to evoke a different feeling. So one is called harsh and one is called, um, I don't know, one is like yearning or wanderlust, right? It's a, it's a yeah. associated with a character who kind of wants to get off the island. Whereas like harsh is like meant to capture sort of the vibes during that part of the game, I think, where everybody's kind of having some personal troubles and demons that are sort of surfacing for them um, in the community. So and yeah, what you the, just please go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, Joey, I was just gonna say what you just said is actually key there because you connected. So the gardens that 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 Kai is cultivating are for specific characters. You're you're given mm -hmm. a task to go and to 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 plant, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, the the muse garden, or you know, um, uh, I'm sorry, blanking on the character names, but mm -hmm. um, you are you are tasked to go and to 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 plant these gardens for these mm -hmm. these specific individuals. And so what what becomes really lovely is that as you're interacting with all of these, I mean, I, I really want to call them sensory um, <laughs> because it does really kind of evoke that really like a holistic kind of enveloping of, of Kai and then the gamer themselves as they're interacting with these different kind of patterns of, of, of sound. Um, you're, you're being enveloped in this, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm envisioning this as like a, a web of, of ecological relations that are kind of sustaining the 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 community itself but i wanted to add that because it's key that kai is gardening for for others it's it's not kind of a let me just go and plant plant yeah. a garden here it's a very purposeful um uh interaction with kind of the history and 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 the locale of um of the island itself matt did you want to add i feel like you were trying to break in at one point during no uh, no I was that was out. uh i i just i was like oh right i forgot about how they're just explaining how the gardening works i jumped right into the um the other stuff but yeah oh, so no, thank you for it's fine no i think i mean it's like one of those things that i've i was reflecting is like actually pretty challenging to explain in a way that sounds compelling right. um but uh I, I think what you did well that, that that's helping me right now in this moment is like how it's different than like the kinds of farming and gardening mm -hmm. games that are have became mm -hmm. popular around the same time. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Stardew Valley, um, right, right. the, um, the Nintendo one, which I'm, it's like not harvest moon. It's the, um, animal crossing. Yeah. Right. Those are, especially Stardew Valley is kind of, it's about building an efficient engine for, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there's lots mm -hmm. of things you can do, but like at the core yeah. of the game is this engine for being more efficient in farming and, um, growing your farming operation and making it easier. But, with this one, you are encouraged to grow certain things for certain people at different times. Mm -hmm. But also, um, as you were saying, Matt, there is a sense that it's, to some extent, it is compositional. And mm -hmm. like, you know, maybe there's one type of plant that you kind of have to grow, but it's like a lot of it is, I mean, it's an end in itself. And it's it's about revitalizing the island and providing a space for maybe someone to sit and contemplate Um you know, you're, you're, you're kind of doing some yeah. restoration work, I think, in some ways, um, for these places that have been, have gone fallow. Yeah, and I kind of like the, um, not the tension, but the differentiation that you both are making uh, with the two kind of different gardening genres, I suppose I can call them in mm -hmm. games. So one is very, you're like um, Animal Crossing is kind of very much geared towards product. You're, you're, you're producing something. Mm -hmm. While this is more, and Matt, kind of this, this goes back to what you were saying in terms of um, the sound and listening and the point of, of sitting still, the, the game for me was incredibly meditative. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it was very much like you kind of are, are transported into this, into this, uh, I don't know, calmer sense of, sense of being for those moments. Um, but the word that comes to my mind is generative. Um, you mm. are you are generating something that mm. that isn't meant to be bartered or sold. Um, it's it's meant to kind of sit and and grow and kind of enrich uh, the the area around it. So I just I yeah. really liked this kind of um, uh, this differentiation that you guys were making between these two kinds of genres as a newcomer. Yeah. <laughs> And not just to take anything just away from to say either. yeah, I, exactly like Animal Crossing. Oh, of course amazing, not. Yeah, actually. Amazing. 
I've lied before. I have played Animal Crossing. So <laughs> everybody <laughs> played Animal Crossing. It doesn't even count. <laughs> so I'm not a complete newbie, but I have played Animal Crossing. Now, I was watching someone stream Stardew Valley just this week, and like it just offers a really different palette of pleasures for the yeah. player. And like there's a lot right. of um, it has a totally different kind of menu of, of activities that you can do. Um, it has some, it's funny, like, I mean, we could be having a whole conversation that was about like the way these gardening games connect to building and strengthening up a community because I think all of those mm, games mm, uh, yeah, really key right. on that but this you know right off the bat you kind of learn that Mutazione is such a isolated island uh, such a small net community everything's run through barter and kind of a gift economy and so mm -hmm. um, there's this funny set of characters these little shapes that uh, we saw briefly in the video they, they're named after like right. Italian meats, I think. One's called sal, 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 Salchiccio or something like uh -huh. that. But they're uh -huh. always talking about, they're always trying to like do capitalist things. They're right, like, ooh, right. you know, the market has some lacuna in it that we need to like put product into. <laughs> or like we, you know, we can make this and that more efficient. But it's it's a goof on the fact that like you learn really early on that like nobody's really doing any commerce on this island. Everything's yeah. just sort of like um, very, very give and take and relational and people are just getting what they need um, from each yeah. other. So it's like it, it it puts the gardening, it takes the gardening away from the agricultural production aspect and right. more towards this yeah. aspect of being um, part of the ecosystem and like fitting into the community and its relationships, which again, turn out to be thornier than you realize when you first get mm -hmm. there. But so it's not, it's not a utopia, yeah. but there's also not like a sort of, um, there's not, there's not the set of like uh, kind of mechanics of accumulation and efficiency that exist around a lot of farming games um, yeah yeah and also i i, I think I, I love what uh you both have been talking about the, about like the transactional nature or the lack of this sort of transaction economy it even goes into um you know pamela you mentioned earlier that yeah the, as kai you're you're creating these gardens for other for the residents of the island but you don't solve their problems mm -hmm. with them you know they're more uh you know it's not like oh i just i needed wheat to make my bakery work and you've planted wheat for me thank you you know it's yeah. it's that you provide in the example of mew like you are just you know mew is grieving and so you create this space for that to happen and so you you create a sense of like solace and meditation and peace for this character but it doesn't you know it doesn't like solve that story right. and then you move on to the next one like the characters will have to carry this you know they have to wrestle with these emotions like after you know even after the gar after the garden is created which just yeah. lends itself to that feeling of like a, this is a you know we can't you know it's a, like goes against that sort of like exceptionalist hero narrative where mm -hmm. this one person is going to come come in and, and solve everyone's problems so i i want to shift or, or sort of like push our focus a little bit more towards some of the uh, ecological and and even like climate themes um mm -hmm. in the game and we we've started to talk around that quite a bit um as we talked about the story and mechanics but i, I wanted to ask you too like how mutazione invokes um, to, to use a phrase that you introduced to me, um, Pamela, climate trauma and, and other themes at the at the intersection, I guess, of community and psychology and uh, ecosystems. Like, how is how is this game kind of approaching and framing like living in the wake of a, a disaster, an environmental disaster and sort of coping with environmental degradation? Because that's something we haven't really said. Like, there's one of the framing things you learn in the narrative is that we we don't quite know why, but the the island is uh its fecundity is is decreasing it seems to there's this um you know there's this tree at the center of its ecosystem and it, it seems to be ailing in some way and you don't really know why um but yeah how are how are people and, the, and then everybody's living in the in the wake of this trauma there's been this um meteor strike that that was incredibly devastating so yeah i don't know i mean pamela I'd i was hoping you could lead us in this but but you know how does how does this game kind of um make meeting with those themes and those ideas? Yeah. Um, the more I think about it, the more it's it's kind of, I'm I'm envisioning this game though. You're, you're kind of in an apocalyptic, a post-apocalyptic space actually um, with the uh, uh, coming in after several, several years after the meteor has, um, um, has hit. So, um, but I, I want to I want to just say that I, I, the post-apocalyptic space isn't something that's devoid of life 
um, it's mm -hmm. a very different kind of life that's going to begin to flourish there. And I think that what's important is that there, the, the, the environmental or ecological well-being of the island is faltering. However, at the same time, Kai is um, beginning to encounter really different forms, maybe and even definitions of, uh, of life throughout, throughout their journey. Um, so the, this post-apocalyptic space is a space in which the, the soil is rich for new generations to like new relations, excuse me, to, to, to begin to emerge, even within this, this kind of larger context of, of the, you know, the ecological well-being beginning to, beginning to falter. And just something connected with that is that we have to kind of deal with, and of course, you know, with some, somebody who's, who's constantly, you know, questioning why are, you know, words um, kind of displayed on the page or chosen for titles in specific ways. And, you know, Matt, as, as, as a writer, I'm sure that you can, you can speak to this as well. I'm just speaking this from, uh, to this from the analytical perspective. Like we have to grapple with the title. Um, and mutazione uh, in, in Italian is uh, mutation. And um, mutation is change, alteration. Um, many times it's kind of in, in, in the pop culture world associated with maybe some sort of monstrosity. Um, well, I think that, yeah, it, that, that we have um, tended to think of mutation as, as something that has finished and yielded some sort of monstrous product or a process that has ended in some um, abnormality. But um, as Kai learns, this is, this is um, uh, a new normal has been created on this, on this island. And I think that translates, that is very heavy metaphors for me translating to, to um, you know, discussing ecological crises uh, or climate change that we're beginning to move into, or we have moved into um, a new normal, um, you know, in the environmental humanities. We have, there, there, are, there are different kind of groups of scholars who do believe that we are now in a post-apocalyptic scenario. There hasn't been any meteor who that has struck us, you know, we haven't necessarily encountered any huge kind of apocalyptic event that we might, you know, associate with, you know, everything that you see in kind of climate change film, films, um, tsunamis, huge wildfires, whatever. But we are in this kind of post-apocalyptic stage. And the whole question is, you know, how are we going to deal with it? How are we going to relearn who we are? How are we going to create relations anew with both each other and the more than human world, um, how are we gonna define the human and the self differently? And I think that that's exactly what Kai is experiencing as she, or as they, as they move through this. Um, uh, the protagonist does have a very strong character arc in my opinion, which um, was, I, I think, incredibly you know, delightful and even thought provoking uh, as they move through these different, these different encounters with the individuals on the island. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll leave that there. Mm -hmm. I, so just summarizing is I do see this as kind of this apocalyptic space as you post-apocalyptic space kind of as you imply, Joey, though I don't mean to put words in your mouth. But there's also something incredibly, I keep on coming back to this word, generative right. about this scene of or the setting of what seems to be disaster. Yeah. Well, it's not, yeah, it's not a it's not a total wipe. It's not a nuclear right. apocalypse, right? Like, or, you know, I mean, I mean, it's not some sort of, yeah, some sort of like nuclear war scenario where there's no biota anymore on the planet. Um, yeah, it's more about, uh, I, I mean, one thing to say is that my understanding and my, my experience understanding as I was playing is that there's been a lot of like novel species that are, mm -hmm. that are now seen yeah. on this, on this island, not just the characters who are kind of like mm -hmm. understood to be like mutated and, and, and had other forms before these, um, cataclysms but but also there's like plants that hadn't before been seen on the island so so like you know to use your word generative like there there has been a flourishing of new life and uh yeah it, I mean there is a kind of like dissonance at the heart of this game it, once you put mm -hmm. that apocalyptic for, you know sort of um uh tag on it where it's like well yeah you I guess like it, it is apocalyptic but it doesn't feel that way to you know it doesn't feel like other apocalyptic yeah. narratives that we're used to it feels like, like we've talked about relaxing and restorative and it's, you know, uh, these people don't seem to be in, you know, in constant agony and they're certainly not, um, tearing each other apart, you know, not physically right. anyway, perhaps emotionally occasionally, but, um, yeah. Um, Matthew, did you want to, uh, add to that? I'd love to hear what you think. Yeah. I mean, it just, I, I, I don't have a ton to add that, um, that was pretty, uh, pretty powerful, um, 
you know, I, I think the the effectiveness of the game is to um, like to treat change as a as the 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 only way there is, you know, like we are all mutants, you know, like we have adapted to our environment mm -hmm. and all creatures are constantly, you know, adapting to their environment. And, um, you know, and so I think this, the way that this, you know, treats the denizens of this uh, community on an equal footing and that there isn't that, that, yeah, you know, as, as Pamela mentioned, there's this, you know, the, the titles, you know, suggests the title alone without the context, like suggests that this is, this might be some kind of like horror game or a thriller or something like that. But it's mm -hmm. in, in fact, that is, it, it turns that on its head, which I think, um, you know, it's just that that's the kind of sea change that I think we, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that we as people living through this apocalypse need to, um, take note of and, and and adapt ourselves to this new world and the world itself kind of they're they're just for for viewers who haven't who haven't um played the game there are definitely visual markers of disaster mm -hmm. um at one point kai leaves the the um the town and begins to explore um kind of the the I don't know, abandoned environment around like the wild or something. Yeah. Right? I believe yeah. It's called. yeah the the, okay. The wild. And you're walking through ruins and yeah. you can see the ruins of, of cities in the background and, mm -hmm. you know, empty gateways and, um, and empty cars. And you mm -hmm. can, you know, move, you have to like move around these, um, these obstructions, um, that, that have clearly kind of fallen, just been left there in the wake of, in the wake of the meteor strike. But at the same time, the the game itself is so unbelievably especially i found when you moved into this this wild space so unbelievably like rich in color mm -hmm. there were suddenly vivid pinks and there were you know vivid blues and the, this was all the the plants themselves um and so i think that even even when you're standing and exploring ruins you are still within this kind of you know headspace or not even headspace physical space of budding beauty uh, which I thought was really powerful. So one thing I wanted to pick up on, actually, um, Pamela, that you introduced was was uh, this idea of the protagonist Kai's um, mm. arc. And I, I wanted to step back to the mechanics of that a little bit, which is, you know, how does this game deal with role playing and like inviting the player uh, of the game to establish an identity and trajectory for Kai? Like, did you feel like Kai was more or less like a, a blank protagonist that where, where you could project yourself or or was it more of the experience of like a fully formed character that you were you were trying to you know put yourself into their into their perspective and shoes a little bit like so I just want to hear how you two kind of conceptualized playing as Kai and you know don't necessarily have to like give away any of the late twists and turns in the plot but like you know however you want to refer to that and, and anchor that because I do think that's important um like the the way that you're encountering this world well we were and when we were originally talking about this we were kind of joking about how like like Joey you and I like tended to play in a similar way where um you know I always take the the like the the more kind of like uh neutral or higher minded uh branch in any kind of like, like dialogue conflict diverse any, branch yeah like yeah. just to avoid yeah any kind of and 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 you know when uh when kai first gets to the island there the the cho the the sort of like dialogue choices that you're given as a player to to sort of inhabit kai's personality there's a it's kind of like a snarky option and then a more sort of neutral, like at like, tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. and Often you can just say dot dot dot, and right, and sort of yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Kai is just so, like blinking at the person. <laughs> and I just, I always like, I'm so worried about offending the system for some reason that I was very much like I played it that way. And then Pamela, you were like, oh, I'm gonna, I want to see, I want to see what the snarky responses give, and and. So for, you know, but for me, it's, it, it, 
it was again like like i saw um you know t- i would say that the that i was like you know but it was 10 percent me inhabiting this character but 90 percent i was experiencing the world through Kai's eyes and this game isn't it wasn't an attempt to um you know to like it's not like this deep uh you know like infinitely branching narrative like you you are experiencing the world through a single character um and so you know and and i think i I think it was just very successful um at at doing that at like giving me the choice about who i could go and have a conversation with but Mm -hmm. not like the choices weren't so deep and wild wild that i could like turn people against each other or you know like um you know significantly throw the narrative off course Mm -hmm. um i felt like i was in the hands of uh these very you know capable storytellers so um but but that's that sort of how i played i was very much in the play it safe category yeah i definitely followed the snark (laughs) but uh but i like the this this you know as you just said matt the storytelling here is really masterful because it's happening on several different levels there's the um kind of this the general over overarching one but then kai themselves also has personal trauma that that they're dealing with Mm -hmm. and uh kai's a teenager so um you as as you and you only learn begin to have hints of Kai's background sort of as the the you know since you're playing Kai it's it's almost kind of assumed that you that you almost um, know a certain amount of information so you, you know you're being fed little tidbits of Kai's background as Kai enters into interactions and dialogue with other characters so that I thought was really fascinating um and and um yeah, just the 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 start the snark was fun only because you could see kind of a another you know sometimes I even chose the snark because I was hoping that it would lead to mm-hmm. um, at one point I think I can't remember which with which character but at one point it it led to some sort of um, uh, discussion of family between two mm-hmm. characters mm-hmm. and and a little bit more of Kai's background is revealed and then a little bit more of Kai's background is revealed and then you could potentially choose to uh, kind of have a teenager fight with your grandfather (laughs) Mm -hmm. who then tells you to go away and cool off a little bit and so the the game kind of you know makes you say all right well as as the player as the gamer I also need to kind of um, insert myself into this circle of relations that's that's going on and Mm -hmm. and play this rich character that is Kai out to to the fullest extent of their of their learning capabilities and that I thought was was really cool um, that was really exciting for me. Yeah, I should say you're you're often just given for for everyone like two or three choices to make in response. Um, so it's not like you're typing in any number of responses right. or anything. Yeah. But like w- one of the things that I started to notice was some of the options are about some of the decisions you get to make are, are about how emotionally open, I guess, or forthcoming mm-hmm. um, that Kai wants to be, or, or maybe how much they want to make conversations about themselves versus just sort of continue to ask questions of the person that they're talking with. And, but as Pamela said, you don't necessarily know that much about, or perhaps this was you, Matthew, sorry, but like you, you don't perhaps know so much about uh, Kai's backstory and like their family history and things like you get t- tidbits, but you can get more information by having the character be more open with the people they're talking with who, you know, who aren't you, the other people in the town. So I thought that was kind of interesting too, where it was like you kind of um, building, building a a psychological model of this character was, is about how they behave in conversation. It's not just, um, it's not like you get all of that information in dreams or by reading their diaries. Yeah. 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 Right. The lore dump. Yeah. they, 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 it was, you know, it's like a really, elegant way of avoiding all that stuff and um yeah you know uh you know and it feels like you know you you get the sense of this place that has existed before kai Mm -hmm. got there and will keep going after kai leaves you know so it's like it it yeah it it feels like a world that's lived in Mm -hmm. there's even a coyness i think about some of it and and this is like me trying to read up to the developer and writer but (laughs) that like 
you have, there's a mechanic where uh, at the end of some of the chapters, which are often a day, mm -hmm. um, you will call your mom. And mm -hmm. the first time yeah. it happened, I was like, oh, I'm going to get all this info. From yeah, mom. yeah. And then those conversations, and it, it gets to Kai's family dynamic, are a bit underwhelming. Uh, the mom character seems a little um, uh, uh, distracted. Uh, the relationship mm -hmm. is clearly not totally perfect at the given yeah. moment. So they're not having these like deep, long discussions. Um, yeah, you have a sibling, your mother's caring for the sibling. Uh, mm -hmm. and is getting distracted. So it was like, I was like, oh, I didn't learn anything. And then um, one of the first people you meet is is your mother who used to live on the island, um, uh, her her best friend when she was a mm -hmm. kid. And sh she like, you're like, okay, I'm going to learn everything about my mom. And that character in that first conversation, this sort of sets the tone mm -hmm. for how a lot of these go. Like she starts like crying, like she has an emotional breakdown because mm -hmm. she's like so overwhelmed by seeing this sort of person from her past. It turns out you look a good bit like your mom. And like, so she cries and cries and you never get any info out of her. And you have to eventually like go back and through over time, that relationship right. happens like all, all of them do really. But like, um, I, I started when I was thinking more about like the information economy early on, I was like, oh, they're kind of faking you out. They're like, you're going to get a bunch of info about your character. Like, <laughs> and you, and, and it takes such a long time. I mean, there, there mm -hmm. is, it is very um, gradual. Um, and, mm -hmm. it, and again, it's like, you're learning by engaging by your character reaching out to other people is how you learn things it's not through yeah. sort of internal self-examination before bed or something yeah and to me that just it feels so much like how we learn about our family history you know like you get these you receive these snippets and and stories and vignettes and like you're trying mm -hmm. to piece together and everyone has a kind of like Rashomon like ver version of these stories and you never really get the full story so that I think that's another way that the narrative felt just like really rich and resonant that you are never you know like the grand you expect the grandfather to be like this authority who has all the you know who has mm -hmm. the the family story but then you know, you come into conflict with him and he's not, he has like an agenda and, you know, it's clear from the talking to the other residents that like, he's not, you know, there, there isn't, you know, there isn't this resident authority and guide that you can rely on in the story, which is mm -hmm. really unique, I think. Well, and you guys are both talking too. So what's striking me about our conversation right now is, is the sense of time um, is really open-ended. Like um, mm -hmm. the, you're talking about the full story, Matt. It's not. It doesn't. It's not. It doesn't have an end. Um, mm -hmm. When yeah. you check in with your with your mother, you're checking in usually at the end of the day. So usually, kind of chapters follow this natural kind of you know nature's nature cycle, um, and that's the only thing that kind that marks your time on the island. And it's very. Um, yeah. I think it's it's really beautifully deliberate. The difference between morning noon and mm -hmm. evening and you have different like you will encounter a character in the morning who says like um oh yeah so good to see you come to the party later uh later right. in the evening we're all gathering and so there's this kind of very um you know this this sense of time is so kind of multi-layered and 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 rich and also just flowing um to me it was it felt incredibly non-linear <laughs> mm -hmm. which uh, which was uh, which was for, for for me really really beautiful to to experience in a game. Um, I mean, and even though you are kind of following, you know, the linear pattern of a day, uh, how you're interpreting and and kind of experiencing those timeframes mm -hmm. through these different conversations that are throwing you back into the past, that are afraid about what's coming into the future. It's beginning to, it, it, it kind of weaves into this, this um, uh, non-linear web. Mm -hmm the only way I can describe it right now. Well, and to, to support that, like what we were talking about earlier, the sort of multiple middles, like you can yeah. just yeah. look at your journal uh, and sometimes they'll just be a key objective. And it's like, okay, clearly yeah. I have to go like deliver this, you know, thing I grew to someone, like that's one particular example. And that'll like end the afternoon. The afternoon's over, then it'll be evening. Right. But, and actually there's like a little clock icon um, to mm -hmm. start the conversation that's going to move things forward. Or you can like you said, Pamela, to question the linearity, you can kind of like spend as much time as you want in the afternoon. And it, it gives you yeah. a sense of that like lazy summer afternoon or something where you're like, I'm going to yeah. talk to everyone or I'm going to like go down in this cave they didn't tell me to go to, or I'll see, right. I'll go back to the the temple on the outskirts of town that I only went to once or something, you know, and that could take a while to like move around to those places. Or you can just be very like kind of goal-directed. Yeah. And then it'll feel quite a lot shorter. And it, 
I mean, that reflects how actual days feel. Sometimes days feel like they just go on and on right. and on. And then sometimes it just feels like, okay, I got one big thing done. And then that was kind of all I had the energy for. <laughs> Yeah. And nobody will probably on this call be surprised that I took my time. <laughs> I wanted that extended <laughs> sense of time <laughs> with my days. <laughs> so um, there's something else I, I wanted us to get to that I, I mentioned up top um, before we wrap this conversation. So I want to just put it in now, which is like how the game deals with the processes of accumulating, sharing, archiving, and using knowledge about the environment and about an ecosystem. Um, I, when we first started talking about this game together, I know you both talked about what I ended up kind of terming the politics of knowledge, the, the mm -hmm. perils and shortcomings of a kind of colonialist model for how environmental knowledge is uh, used and gathered. And that, it's not to say the game models that, but it's like that comes up in the game. That is a story mm -hmm. element in the game. And, and it's something the game is kind of poking at and deliberating about through its characters. And I just wanted to hear what you both thought of, of, about that because we, we, and we have been talking so much about how this is a game about unraveling a mystery and gathering knowledge. So like, what is, what is the, how does the game want you to think about that sort of quest for knowledge and especially about an environment or about plants and animals and people? The grandfather is a scientist. And I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. But as this individual who is kind of giving you tasks throughout the game to complete, and sometimes these are kind of search and find tasks, like go out and find a plant. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Nono has a very specific way of engaging with the natural world. It's, it's a very traditional scientific way of engaging with the natural world where um, um, I think, you know, at one point he's, he's, he's very interested in order, cataloging, categorizing um, the insight, you get an encyclopedia, which was shown in the, in very quickly in that first initial video. And I think he's, he's written that encyclopedia. I think he has categorized he's, everything. He's like the co-author of it with perhaps like the, right. the, the town's archivist, I think. Yeah. It turns out they have like a, a yeah. deep complicated history that you don't yeah. know about right away. Yeah. Um, where was I going with that? So there's this one kind of very firm and very familiar to especially to 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 Western gamers, uh, way of approaching understanding the natural world. Um, this view of science or of of knowledge, I don't even want to say of science of knowledge, will eventually be challenged. Um, Nona will eventually come up against a challenge, and and Kai is going to to help him through it. Um, and that's um, you know beginning to enter into the climax of 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 the narrative. Um, but at one point, there are different kind of ways of understanding and, and knowing the environment, um, this kind of post-meteor environment. Um, and at one point, the archivist, uh, one of the characters, is, is talking about another entity um, in the, the, the town's history, or the island's history. Um, this character is called Mani, and you never see Mani, you just hear stories about about this um, this entity um, but is it okay if I read out a quote Joey because this is please something do that, yeah, yeah. okay to do that okay. oh, I was kind of hoping you would because I remember <laughs> I remember yeah. us talking about this this moment uh, this has stuck with me so like profoundly because I think this is a very sophisticated there's a very sophisticated level of storytelling throughout this game in terms of its mm -hmm. commentary on knowledge production and knowledge sharing and this I think kind of gets to the heart of it so Yoke is talking to the archivist is, is speaking to Kai and you you check in with Yoke every once in a while to to gain new information about the island um, and about um, Nono's kind of well-being. Um, but uh, Yoke is talking about this other character, Mani, and uh, he says about Mani, she never liked to tell, only to invite us to think and to work together. And this, I think, is beautiful because this is what the game also does. <laughs> um, it's right. asking the gamer to, you know, enter into this game, into this specific scenar scenario of community building in the in the wake of, of disaster and um, uh, and 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 live Kai out according to kind of that. Let's let's work together. Um, we're not going to tell. We're going to invite you to think through through this game. So those are two um, kind of polar opposite um, profiles of knowledge that I think the game offers. 
that uh, to me, like just added kind of a level of, of depth that, that got me really excited. <laughs> Yeah, that's really beautiful. And, and, you know, I think that's just another way that the gardening metaphor works so well in this to, mm -hmm. to reinforce this, because yeah. it's, it is about, you know, you, you, it, it is, a, this is going to take time, like the, you know, mm -hmm. it is the movement is not on your timeline, right? Like you have to uh, tend this garden and, and, and meet it where it is at any point in the game, you know, each plant that you um, each seed that you plant has a life cycle and you watch those life cycles and you, you know, like you can, um, you know, replenish them and keep the garden going, but you can't force it. You know, like you can't speed it along. You are subservient to, mm -hmm. um, to the growth of this, you know, environment that you are, um, bringing into the world. No, no yeah. is also human. I think it's worth pointing that mm -hmm. out that he is the only human on the island before Kai right, right. comes to visit. So there's also a really interesting discussion of, you know, maybe species and knowledge, different forms of knowledge mm -hmm. production and understanding, you know, your your um, you know, the location and the setting of of where you live in the world. Yeah, is there something to be said, Pamela? I guess, you know, this thing makes me think of something that I feel like is I hear from a lot of environmental researchers, environmental humanities researchers, which is like this turn to thinking about the, I think you've said more than human or sort of relationship between humans and, and non-human entities. Um, I mean, the game certainly directly confronts that by showing you all of these like sentient mutants. And we even meet some that we're told are, were never human. Like there's this, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. the 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 character who you give a, a vitamin to in, in the video I showed mm -hmm. in the beginning. Um, Jelly. Jelly right. is like, <laughs> yeah. we're told like, oh, that like Jelly didn't mutate from uh, a human being. Um, they mutated from something else. And, and we learn later that, uh, I mean, I, I don't think it's a huge spoiler to say that they're actually like, they were sort of coaxed into being um, by by one of the scientists. They were kind of like created in some way or, or, or sort of, for, you know, um, deliberately mutated. Um, but then of course, as we talked about, there's like all of these, especially the plants, but there's all of these sort of non-human entities and assemblages of non-human entities mm -hmm. um, that are around. And I don't know, I, I, I would just like to, you know, if you have thoughts on that or, or um, you know, impressions, I, I would love to hear them because I think to me, the game seems really in dialogue with that conversation that that I always hear going on in academia but like it's it's really cool to see it um portrayed differently here yeah um the thing that's striking me right now is um kind of uh Nono's more what what we might call kind of traditional science western scientific knowledge um comes from a space of of power um given through order which is interpreted as an order that nature is supposed to follow um, at least that's how, you know, the, the human sees this. Nature follows specific patterns. It follows a specific order. Um, the island completely kind of, I think, turns that on its head. Um, mm. The order that we think that, you know, nature abided by, that the environment abided by is no longer, it's mutated. Um, and with that, the island, I think, is actually kind of challenging. Um, it's char the characters that live on it, the, its inhabitants to think differently along with it. And when that begins to happen, there is a shift in the ecological health. Um, and this is a very prevalent um, mode of thinking in the environmental humanities, um, specifically, for example, along the lines of, you know, thinking about how um, uh, Western forms of knowledge um, might begin to partner and collaborate and co-produce knowledge of our world with other forms of, uh, of, of knowing the world, for example, indigenous um, uh, uh, forms of knowledge, um, and uh, which very much aren't uh, based on a set of rules or, 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 or laws, but a, but a relational experience that is, that is intergenerational um, and comes from a very, very, very deep knowledge of, of the land. So in that case, I, I kind of, I, I definitely see, Joey, the, the, this kind of academic but I don't even want to call it academic. <laughs> this dialogue of life yeah. that's happening, uh, I, I see this definitely um, percolating up through throughout the game. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that it's kind of a very beautiful way of teaching, um, yeah. you know, the, the importance of 
of not, and I'm not kind of dichotomizing these two knowledges and saying that one is better than the other, but they're very much as a beautiful hybridity in the end. And that's mm. how you, you get to a, a stage of, um, I don't know, we can call it healing. We can call it the ability to sit and listen better. We can call it the ability to dwell um, mm. in a specific place and with the specific sense of self. Um, that was when, when the game ended. Uh, I, I won't say how, how it ends, but when the game ended, um, that was the specific, there's a specific picture that comes up on, mm -hmm. on the screen. And that's for me, how, how it kind of emotionally felt that we're being asked to kind of dwell in a specific place through these specific temporalities um, in relation with each other. Yeah, I'm not I, sure if that answered your question. Well, no, I mean, <laughs> I mean it, you know, it brought something to the surface for me, which is I was just thinking like, you know, again, not to overly dichotomize here, but, but you do get, you know, you get an encyclopedia, uh, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and jelly, a character we've been talking about is like a chemist, like they make soap yeah. and, um, uh, I think maybe fertilizers and medicine, they make like, you know, they're, they're using, they have a chemistry set like in their, in their house. Um, and, and, you know, that's not seen as, as othered from like the relationships you're meant to value in the game. That's part of it. They, you know, they actually, right. they, that, that, that character plays an important part in the ecosystem. But then, okay, so you've got the encyclopedia, you've got this chemist, but then on the other hand, key bits of information about like this central environmental mystery in the game are delivered through dreams, poems, mm -hmm. and rituals, right? You go to, you literally go to like a temple uh, and, and there's this like bird-like apparition, mm -hmm. like I won't say too much, but it's pretty early in the game that, that like starts to throw off your sense of what's really afoot um, in the island. So there's all of this other you know, and then of course there's all the conversations that you have to kind of navigate emotionally as much as sort of um, analytically and cognitively to like get useful information and and be able to figure out what's happening. So so I think there's like all of these different types of information and knowledge that you're having to kind of harmonize together. And then of course there's like what's happening in the gardens themselves, and we can get back to that of like the music and like mm -hmm. the songs mm -hmm. that you're playing mm -hmm. and the music being emitted by the plants. So it's like I do think that the game is trying to kind of model like what this um more hybrid approach you know might might feel mm -hmm. like to live in where it's not like one or the other it's not like oh we have to like forswear modernity in order to like <laughs> live in harmony with the environment right it's right, like right trying to find a situated balance like or harmony whatever that's going to mean and mutual recognition i think mm -hmm. that's that's mm -hmm. really key matt did you want to no, I just, I mean, uh, while, while you both were talking, I was just thinking again about that, the GDC talk from Hannah Nicklin that was called Kill the Hero, Save the World, you know, sort of provocative title, especially in the context of GDC, where, you know, so many of the games we see are, you know, the, you know, uh, variants of the hero's journey. And... I should say that's the game developers conference for those. Oh yeah. Sorry. GDC. Yeah. So <laughs> sorry. that's a, it is a, Thank it you. Is a conference and award <laughs> yeah. ceremony, um, that uh, I think happens annually, right. That yeah, where we're going on right now. Yeah. It's actually unfolding as we're recording this, but, um, uh, but yeah, that's yeah. So sorry about that. No, no. Um, it's okay. But yeah, I mean, so I think there, there was a, you know, there was a, a strong sense of purpose on the developer's part to, to like, to create a storytelling um, vessel that, that, that ran counter to that, right? That like, yeah. to, you know, this, the, that, that knowledge is a shared experience and that there is no, you know, the, like no one person, no one individual is going to save us or you know like come up with a solution we have to all do it together and that kind of actually ties back to what was what we were talking about at the very beginning of this conversation where the gardening the process of gardening is a processual process processual process mm -hmm. um uh knowledge itself as well is and the and the action of knowing or how are you 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 want to you whatever you want to call it um is a is a process itself that takes time and needs to be recognized as a process rather as benchmarks that you can reach mm -hmm. and then come away with this you know kind of prepackaged and I think to a certain extent Kai expects that at the beginning as she or as they mm -hmm. push for um, knowledge from from Nono and Nono interestingly enough almost keeps it within this this story arc that Kai is going to have mm -hmm. to explore 
Yeah, a bunch of the characters actually, um, there is many times, especially in the first half, I suppose, but it, in just in general, where you will be seeming to get somewhere in terms of like learning about an important thing. There's actually, this happens with Yoke the Archivist at one point. He has dug something up for you about this mysterious poem that seems to be the key to everything. And then you're talking to him about it and you're like, okay, I, you know, like, what does it mean? Or like, you know, what did you find out? And he's, he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting really emotional and I'm, I'm getting mm -hmm. kind of upset. And you don't know why. I mean, you find out why later, but like you you can't keep the conversation going. You have to be like, OK, I guess I'll come back another time. Or I think right. he sends you to talk to another character. But it's like that happens several times. I mentioned it with uh, Claire, who is your, your mother's friend. You're, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm going to learn all about mm -hmm. my mom. And then she gets upset. It's like or, or people are going through a thing and you're like, oh, maybe I'll learn from this person. I know they know something I don't know. But it's like they want to talk about like this breakup they're having or whatever. And right. that's like so it's it's like there isn't a sort of like you know, efficient forcing mechanism for, for getting this information. You have to like become part of the community um, right. and you have to obey the rhythms of the island or whatever to be kind of mystical yeah. about it. Like you can't, um, you can't just sort of spreadsheet out the solution mm -hmm. to the mysteries or, or, or find a key to get into like the basement right. to, to read all the documents or something. Okay. So, uh, I want to wrap uh, this before I say farewell by just um, Matt. Matt, you mentioned uh, the Eno uh, mm -hmm. piece that that was an inspiration for the game. I don't know if there's any other um, points of you know as you played this, like things it reminded you of, or kind of like you know other games or other kinds of musical experiments or pieces that you felt like were because um, I feel like we haven't talked a ton about them. You know, we sort of talked a bit about mm -hmm. the music generation, but we've drifted away from it. Um, I just wanted to give you a chance to say anything else about like the mechanics of it or or things that you thought were playing into it, kind of like the um that Eno experienced it. Making a procedural piece of music can be as easy as, you know, like having having something, you know, spitting out a chart of um you know, MIDI notes, which are MIDI is I don't know what they I, I'm careful with my acronyms now, but like essentially it's it's notes that a um that a computer can read and play back as any instrument and so um you know you could make a procedural piece of music that is just kind of like spitting out in any instrument in any configuration you want uh, a melody um but the you know these developers wanted to create something that felt like it it was made by humans and that it had this human thumbprint on it um, and that it was handcrafted and organic. And so um, all of the samples of all of the um, plants in the game were recorded by those are, you know, those are all played live by the composer and then cut up mm -hmm. into clips. Um, and they, you know, I think, you know, they spent a, a lot of time more time than just composing the you're you know playing the melodies with the instruments they spent more time carving out periods of silence mm -hmm. um which i found really interesting and really mm -hmm. you know like made this feel made these gardens feel like not so much a you could imagine that if every plant you you put in the ground create like there's a saxophone here and a you know, an oboe over here is just going to create this kind of cacophony as you fill in the garden. And they solve that problem really elegantly by having it sort of evolve over time, um, just in, in terms of the composition. So they, you know, they limited it to, you know, only five instruments at a time are playing. And there are these, the, the, um, the, the, the music sort of surges and then recedes and then surges again. It's not just a like playing a single melody at full blast, like for the duration of the time you're sitting there. There are these periods where almost nothing is playing. And I think that goes back to, mm -hmm. you know, what Pamela mentioned about the meditative quality of it. It just mm -hmm. it puts you in this. You know, you are you you find yourself like leaning in, listening for like, oh, is it still playing? Like, oh, there is actually a bell playing here, and oh, it's that that was just a transition into a you know a refrain of this garden's melody. So, um, you know, so I, I think the that's just another way that I was really impressed at how they they made it feel composed, even though they gave up you know so much of the control 
was given over to the player, um, it still feels like an elegant, you know, thing that you want to listen to. And I found myself like just wanting to go back to the gardens to just sit in them and listen, which I, I just, you, you, on paper, that just doesn't, I, I, I wouldn't be sold on that if I just read a description of like, you'll want to come back to these gardens and just sit and listen to them. But I found that I was like, you know, kept picking up the switch, which is what I played it on, like returning to those uh, places just because it was so, you know, peaceful and beautiful. Yeah. If you're walking by one of them, it's like, I always am like, okay, yeah. I'm going to stop on the way. Right. And like, right. you know, taking some music and yeah, it definitely punctuates um, the other things that you're doing. All right. Well, I think we're at time. So, I mean, thank you so much, Pamela and Matthew, for joining me today. Um, and I'm going to put for folks here some information about you in the chat and links, but I will also read those through. So we'll be hosting more uh, CSI Skill Tree events in 2023. Um, if you want to be notified about episodes, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash imagineasu. Uh, and visit our website, csi.asu.edu, where you can subscribe to our emails as well. Um, you can learn more about Pamela and her work at pcaralero.com and learn more about Matthew and his work at matthewderby.com. I'd also like to thank um, my colleagues at the Center for Science and the Imagination for making this event possible, and especially uh, to Devin Hakal for, uh, edit it, uh, for editing our gameplay video and uh, combing together you know, combing through all the footage that I that I threw at him to uh, to come up with three tight minutes that capture so much uh, about this experience. Um, and to everybody uh, who hung out with us today, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, this was such a, a learning experience and a wonderful time. So Matthew, Pamela, again, thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you, for Joey. Thanks, me. everybody. Yeah, absolutely. It's all been right. great. Yeah. Have a good rest of the afternoon. <laughs>